Ladies and gentlemen, if we could please take our seats, we want to continue. Thank you, folks. If we could take our seats, please. Can we have everybody sit, taking their seat, please? I just have one announcement to make. That lunch will be served at the New Wing restaurant. That is the, that building, the first building, second floor. Lunch will be served there at one. So when we're done here, so that tells you something, by lunch will long be done. So you, you can walk at leisure to, 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 to the lunch. I'll give over to, to Dr. Fisser to facilitate this, this um, session. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, I am cognizant of time, um, and I know that both Chair and Minister do need to leave um, within the course of this session. Uh, so I do want to try and keep it to an hour, but I do believe that an hour will be uh, enough time to have, uh, I would hope, fruitful discussions. Um, uh, Chair and I decided to make a slight change, so we are actually going to ask our experts to come and join me up here on, on stage. Um, so I'll introduce them as we're going along. Um, first of all, I've got Shyam Ranshad. Uh, he's an associate uh, director of, digital, of the Digital Transformation Group from Deloitte. Um, Cheyenne's work uh, really looks at large digital transformation uh, both in South Africa and e into Africa. So if we maybe give him a hand as he's coming up. Um, then we have Professor Leona Crawford from the University of Western Cape. Um, Leona was previously with the HSRC um, and now at the University of Western Cape on behalf of the, the DTPS, um, runs the, the, sorry, where have I got it now, the CoLab. Um, one of the big areas there is um, e-inclusion, uh, which is a big topic for us, ensuring that everybody has access to e-infrastructure um, and services uh, and also social in innovation. So Leona, thank you. Um, we also then have, oh, there's Shyam. Shyam, you can come up and take a seat. Um, also then have Ilza Kach from the Department of Trade and Industry. Uh, Ilza is the head of the Future Industrial Production Systems um, group within, or directorate within the DTI. Previously, Ilza had uh, a number of years, she tells me 28, I still don't believe her, um, at Treasury, um, and now runs that directorate within, within the DTI, so looking at uh, fourth Industrial Revolution Systems within the DTI. Um, Professor Crane Sudin um, from the Human Resources, uh, Human Sciences Res Research Council. <laughs> um, why do we all get stuck on that one? <laughs> um, previously the DVC at UCT um, holds a PhD in education. Um, so thank you very much, Prof Sudin, for coming through for us. Um, and then from the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research, um, Fuller Fellow Nawumando. Um, Fuller Fellow is a 
I suppose, a, a broad digital scientist. He currently runs the modeling and digital sciences group within CSIR. Um, and come 1st of April, we, we'll be running the Smart Institutions and Enterprises Group within the CSR. Uh, obviously, the Smart Institutions is an area that we will be focusing on heavily as CSR and we'll be working quite closely with public institutions. So please, could I have a round of applause for the expert panel? Oh, I've forgotten one. I was just, there's an extra chair here, and I was, I was a bit confused for us. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> um, Jonathan Fries from um, the, I mean, from the um, Western Cape Education Department. Um, Jonathan is the head of ICT, um, Curriculum Development, uh, and also driving the inclusion of fourth industrial revolution or disruptive technologies into the education system. My apologies, Jonathan. <laughs> Thank you very much. We'll give him a separate round of applause. Thank you very much. <laughs> Um, we thought we'd do it slightly differently today in that we don't necessarily want to hear from the experts first. We've heard a number of areas from, from the minister and from the chair um, that we need to consider. And we would like to open up to the floor, first of all, um, for questions and queries and comments. Um, and after that, I will have the panel um, have a bit of a word about their particular areas, but also then respond to a number of those questions. So at this stage, I would like to open it to the floor for any comments and questions. Take over here. If we could take a number at a time, please. Okay, I'll start with this one. If you could please just indicate name and where you're from, department. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, my name is Bushe Kanyila. I'm with the HSRC. Very much enjoyed the, the inputs this morning. I just wanted to make one contribution. I was just raising it with the minister right now, is that I think that one of the things which I don't think we've really started earnestly looking at, even at the HSRC or on much of the platforms I've been on, is the human aspect, but more specifically, the psycho-emotional aspect of it. How, as we take up these technologies, the question really for me is what are we becoming in the process of this? what and who are we becoming in the process of this. But more specifically, maybe I'm thinking about things such as digital addiction or the so-called screen addictions, um, which some research already shows that it has implications of poor sleep, physical, mental health, anxiety and depression, cognitive outsourcing, and, 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 and. So are we doing anything about that now or preempting or anticipating this? Can we begin some of that work? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I have any other queries and comments? I'll take over there and then over there. Yep. Thank you. My name is Tendama Dima. I'm a support staff committee section. I would like to appreciate the fact that we are involved in the new revolution. But I want to find out that about three, three things in particular. The issue about the curriculum development or curriculum revolution. Uh, at the moment, we're dealing with CAPS, which is running until such a period, but I'm not too sure if the preparation for now is for 10 years later or there's going to be something done immediately. I do understand that the minister mentioned something about silo mentality, where there is no complementarity and universal uh, <laughs> working together. But as a, as a matter of fact, I want to find out from the panel whether the research and development that you are talking about will also involve calling of papers where people are going to contribute ideas in order for them to at least assist in the soliciting of new ideas. Thirdly, I want to know whether there's someone who can tell me who owns the copyright of uh, the Industrial Revolution, Fourth Industrial Revolution. And lastly, is there any challenge that might be caused by the cyber threat, or you call it cyber security, in, in line with the fourth industrial revolution that we are trying to come up with? Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, uh, Dr. Fisa. Manlang, my name is Manlang Ngobo. I'm from TPSA, I'm the government CIO. I think I want to it's, just, it's a comment rather than a question. Uh, the extent to which uh, technology is emphasized as if uh, it, is, it is the actual uh, uh, FYR. One appreciates the extent to which it's got 
uh, the impact, but I think we want to look at it as the enabler rather than it being for her up. But why am I raising this in particular? It's because if you look at the public service point of view, and from an improved service delivery, which is where you've got the citizen that's, uh, at the center, one of the important things is how do you change organizational designs and the processes so that they're effective and are able to ensure that citizens are getting a, 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 a better service. So I'm saying, as much as technology is one of the important enablers, we, I think we want to strike a balance between the various issues. For instance, if you want to improve performance of organizations, and it ties very closely to the, to, to the human aspect that is raised there, to say there are other issues that would make it uh, work and, and be much more effective, that I think we, we need to kind of also pay some attention to it. Thank you. I'm going to take at the back there, then the two gentlemen over here, and then that side, yep. At the back there. Huh? Uh, thanks for the opportunity. My name is Desiree. I represent the Media Development and Diversity Agency. Um, this is just an appeal uh, based on the speech that was made by the minister to, you know, in developing or in finalizing the, the digital strategy that the commission doesn't neglect uh, community print media because this, in my view, is still a very powerful tool of communication, especially in, in rural areas with our grassroots communities, and especially for the fact that uh, this uh, medium still sort of promotes indigenous languages. But in recent times, whenever media is discussed, it is always just broadcast, and they, and they tend to like sort of be ignored or lag behind. So if, if in the strategy, in developing the strategy, print media is also considered equally as broadcast media, so that their digitization is also prioritized, especially community print, because they are facing numerous challenges um, that are actually threatening their existence. Thank you. Thank you, over here. Good day, I'm Bernard Gering, CTO from Zanzisan. So the question I would like to pose to the panel, as the minister pointed out earlier, is that um, connectivity, internet connectivity, forms the foundation of the fourth industrial revolution. Without that, that basic cornerstone, most of the auxiliary and um, like, uh, I'm gonna say complementary effects will never really be seen. So based on my experience and, and, and the discussions I've had with telecommunications operators, with the manufacturers, um, at the moment it seems like LTE is, is sat not saturated, but the chances of that permeating to our rural communities is slim. Okay, then we're looking at, at 5G as an up and coming technology that would probably be centered around the metropoles. So how are we going to address connectivity on a rural level to include equally a greater number of the South African populace? That's my primary question. Thank you. Yeah, we're coming here. Thank you. <coughs> oh, sorry. Um, my name is Siraj Mohammed. I work in the Parliamentary Budget Office, but I have to stress this is not an issue we've discussed or taken a position on, so I speak as an individual, or my comments are, and also I think my comments that I'm going to make come out of my experience as an expert on international finance and having taught postgrad courses in the development of the global financial system and architecture over a long time. Um, and I think the important analogies between a process of financial globalization and the discussion and how we frame the 4IR because it's such a complex area that people will pick up on things and often in a decontextualized way. So when we talk about the role of the state, the size of the state and the economy, the um, PPPs, the, um, you know, our people's lives are affected, we don't see that. And I think there's a really interesting analogy we can make with what happened at the end of the Bretton Woods arrangements, where we had a coordinated world in terms of agreement on how the global financial system should work in the global financial architecture that controlled global financial flows. And we can think about that as an analogy with data in a sense, and how disruptive, and, and also the opportunities that came with, and the damage that came with financial flows, and what that meant right down to the grassroots in, in economies. And one of the things I've, been, I've done research on and tried to study 
when I was in academia, was to look at the impact on South African businesses, corporate restructuring within the global environment. And I think what we need to do is take a step back when we're talking about 4IR, especially if we're going to be bringing the legislature and thinking about regulation, starting from ethics, starting from ideology, starting, we, we, I mean, a lot of the globalization and the financialization happened with the dominant countries that adopted neoliberal policies. And the way in which it was implemented, the way in which it was <coughs> absorbed in the economies was within an ideological framework. And, and we may have an opportunity within South Africa, you know, as we approach, I mean, people saying it started, but we, we sort of, in a really uncertain time, that we can seriously think about, you know, what is market-driven, what is state-driven, what does the state do? And, I mean, we've heard quite a few times that, you know, the, the government plays a small role in the economy. But, I mean, if you look at general government, if you look at GDP in terms of expenditure, general government consumption is 20%. Government investment and SO investment is nearly 10%. We're talking about 30% of GDP. We're talking about also how services are provided, whether it's done in a market-based or non-market-based. And that affects, for instance, how we think about access, empowerment, schooling, education, health, all those things where, where 4IR is gonna make a huge impact at the grassroots in people's lives. And so I think, I mean, that kind of broad global systemic thinking in terms of uh, uh, thinking through our global financialization occurred may be one way in which we can start framing how to understand at a very, very macro level the impacts of the 4IR or how to start thinking about 4IR. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, there were two right at the back first and then Alex just in front. And then uh, Shafiq the Adams, Water Research Commission. Um, to um, one question and a comment. Uh, key to this, or a keystone of, of all these things are data. Uh, and the question is, do you have a, an approach of how we're gonna fund, how we're gonna monitor, who's gonna own it, and uh, where the cura curation of this will, will sit? Um, so essentially, d the issue of around data democratization, because I thinking, I th I'm thinking we, we're kind of putting the card before the horse. We have not sorted that out as a country. And my next question or comment is, is the ex or maybe exclusion of the environmental sector on the panel deliberate or an oversight? Okay, that was mean. <laughs> Potentially an oversight, definitely not deliberate. Um, the environmental sector is a big sector. Maybe I can represent it. <laughs> Okay, thanks. Alex? Um, thank you. So to, to add on to the earlier comment, I think the importance of data is, is very underrated. So, uh, sorry, I'm Alex Conway from Number Boost, and we're a startup based in Cape Town and do a lot of work in AI. And in all of the work that we do, the most important piece is the data. And Peter Norvig, the director of research at Google, has done some great work showing that very simple models with lots of data outperform more complicated models with less data. And there's been an interesting movement uh, over the last few years around making data publicly available to then crowdsource solutions to problems around that data. So there was a big competition where Netflix offered a million dollars and the smartest researchers in the world submitted solutions to their recommendation engine challenge on the data they made public. Um, there are many examples of this. A platform called Kaggle got acquired by Google that enabled any company to put forward a data problem. And in almost all of those problems, the state of the art was pushed significantly by just crowdsourcing solutions. And there's a public leaderboard component, so people's vanity makes them want to compete. Um, but these aren't just, you know, trying to figure out what movie to recommend next. Right now, there's a competition going on where an Australian mining company has published mountains of data and there's a million dollar prize pool to whoever can find minerals in, in that data and, and unlock the value in that data. And so there's a narrative around data being the new oil or the new gold, but someone needs to crunch 
all of that ground to find that valuable resource. And I think you know it's great to be training millions of data scientists, but really they need the data to work with. And I think there's some interesting challenges there around companies you know, not wanting to expose their private data. So we do some work with uh, some financial companies and they don't want their data to be used in models that their competitors use. But the more data we have, the better our model. So if they all cooperated instead of competing, they could all have a better model. And there are ways to encrypt data such that a model trained on the encrypted data and the unencrypted data produce the same outputs. So I think there are some interesting ways to encrypt data and, and allow training of models uh, in such a way that you still keep private data private but build much better solutions. Um, and so one more thing I'll add on to that and then try to finish with a question is, you know, there's no reason that Uber has to be a company or Airbnb has to be a company. The reason why Airbnb is worth more than the five biggest hotel chains put together is they've created an economy of trust. I'll stay in an Airbnb because I can trust that Airbnb will intermediate. They've screened the person who will be my host and they'll step in if there are any issues. And similar for Uber, you know, there's this joke that, uh, if you told someone 20 years ago that you're going to get into a stranger's car and go sleep on a stranger's uh, apartment, like people would look to you like you're crazy. But I, I mean, I don't own a car and I stay in a lot of Airbnbs. And uh, right now, Airbnb is capturing all that value in the network they provide. And the network is valuable because there are many nodes on the network. It's a network effects business. Same with Uber. If Uber only had five drivers, it would take 20 minutes for me to get an Uber. But because they have 1,000 drivers in Cape Town, the maximum waiting time is low. Um, and so, you know, there's no reason why those drivers have to give Uber a 25% cut. Uber's facilitating the network, but that could very well just be a network between the drivers if there was a mechanism to trust them. And I think one thing that government can do really well is prove that people are who they say they are. They can be the custodian of identity, and identity is really the underpinning of trust, which is central to all of these decentralized businesses and network effect businesses. So my question would be around, you know, what what the plan is with respect to making data publicly available, and and you know, how do you match the data to the data scientists, and and just try to simulate some thought around the importance of the data itself. Cool. Thank you. Um, there are a couple more here, and then I'll come that side. So one, and then two, three, four, and then I'll come back over there. Yep. Hi, um, Kululeko. Um, just to stay on the point of data that is important, I think um, if we have already figured out like um, that the four hours should be broken down into society, industry, business, and skills 4.0, um, I, I for one feel that there is a, a gap in looking into social media data and then looking at, at popular keywords, hashtags, which um, speak on these four, well, at ICS propositions. And that's a way that we could see what what's the the issues we have now within the society, the skills and the business based on the user generated content and then draft a way forward from that. And then I think um, having frameworks and, and building theories around what's being publicly known, what's being publicly said is, 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 central, is central to looking forward. Cool, thank you. Maybe I can just make a comment because I was queried last time and uh, I see I, I realized that I didn't correct it I think we need to do hashtag environment as well um, <laughs> I missed it last time <laughs> Thank you. hi there it's uh, Michael here from the HSRC I'm leading a task team on the fourth industrial revolution within the human sciences research council <clears throat> and I'm just going to look into some elements of the story that we're telling ourselves here because to me, uh, <clears throat> it's helpful to look at the 4IR as a narrative. And I think there's some things we've covered very well, and there's some that are perhaps in the background. And I think we've looked at the technological scope. We've gone over what technologies we're talking about, and we've looked at the, the scope of outcomes that we want, what kind of things we want for this country. We've looked at the issues, uh, but I want to look at the issue of change per se, because one of the central propositions of this thing, at least, in the story that comes out of the World Economic Forum is that it's about accelerating technological change, tech change that gets more rapid over time. 
and that in turn creates accelerating change in other domains, the economy, society, culture. It means you need to accelerate policy change and legislative change to react to that. So if, if we look at this story then, in a sense it's important that we have contemporary responses to these specific tech, to AI and to robotics and an automation and ICT. But my interpretation of that central proposition is that it's not only about the specific technologies. Uh, firstly, the 4IR concept emerged in 2016, right? The scope's already shifted. In two years' time, it'll shift again. So for me, what we need to put on the table as well is, the, is what I'm calling adaptive capabilities, per se, over and above the specific technologies, the ability of the system to adapt to technological change as it happens. And from that point of view, there are two kinds of broad areas. One is adaptive capabilities must be a policy aim. For example, as been mentioned, universities being more responsive to industry needs, industries being more able to talk to universities, government having more effective links with both, and so on, the research being more integrated with policy functions. And uh, extending internet access is exactly that. It's about adaptive capabilities. People cannot adapt to these changes if they're on the wrong side of the digital divide. And then I think another broad umbrella is how the policy process works. It can't take 18 months to respond to technological change if Moore's law doubles computational power within 18 months. It means you're always, you're always behind target and you're not relevant. So that means in some sense policy cycle must be shorter and maybe you need devolved policy, perhaps at the city level in some respect. And uh, the minister, uh, you know, I was in very firm agreement with almost uh, all, all the things that were said. But what was said was that uh, this fourth industrial revolution does away with ge geographical location. But I think in some sense we need to look at human settlements and cities and regions that are in touch. The, the Cape Town area is in touch with Silicon Cape. That's, that's a geographical location. Um, and then ju just to go back to the narrative that we have, right? We have this very narrative. Last, last point, Michael. Very last point. Um, because of this change, we can't get stuck in a narrative. The story that we're telling ourselves itself needs to change. And all I want to put forward is that we remain flexible in the story we tell ourselves in the parliamentary process, as well as the government and academic processes. Thank you very much. I'm going to take just a few more questions because we do need to leave time um, for the discussion. Um, so I'll take the two here. I know that Honourable Causa has requested and then the one at the back. Okay, the two that were on this side. Okay, thanks. Uh, uh, if you could just keep it brief, please. My name is Cesar uh, uh, an employee of Parliament. And my question really is around the current shift in the global economic balance uh, of forces and the predictions that Africa is fast becoming the star for future economy, which, which therefore takes me to, the, to one of the flagship programs uh, of, the, of, of the Vision 2063, which is a Pan-African E-Network. And I just want to check whether there are any plans currently in place to explore the possibilities provided by Fourth Industrial Revolution uh, so that we are able to redefine uh, the integrated uh, African economy? And if so, uh, what are the plans in as far as the education is concerned? Are we to see an education that will be altered uh, to respond to the current demands of the integrated uh, economy, uh, African economies? And lastly, whether within South Africa we, we were thinking of any areas of specialization particularly in aspects where, for example, there are certain technologies that we might not have and therefore where we need to develop skills uh, so that they enable us uh, to, to, be the role, to be the key role players and not the followers in the, in the, in the context of the fourth industrial revolution. Thanks. Thank you. My name is Romeo Gilfillan, uh, also from Parliament. My question is around the legislation, particularly around um, data collection, because I think the fourth industrial revolution is largely about data. And now looking at how we collect the data and process it in relation to how we do the machine learning, particularly in, in terms of um, artificial intelligence, because we are a country with a complex history and 
currently we still have issues of bias, be it racial bias or gender bias, being still an issue in, in the country and I think across the world. Currently with the algorithms used for artificial intelligence, certain things are still not 100% okay. Do we have plans to actually address those challenges before uh, we, 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 we adopt some of these technologies or before we allow companies to implement some of the technologies? Because we know that, for example, in, in the health sector, if you don't have samples that are large enough that have people with skin cancer, for example, um, of, of a darker pigmentation, they may not pick it up, meaning you'll find false results in, in those tests that may be used by the healthcare industry. So how are we ensuring that now in, in terms of the data sets that we feed to these machines is actually inclusive of all of us? Thanks. Excellent question, thanks. Um, I think we need to move to phenotypic variations. Um, there are quite a lot of variations uh, around. Um, Honorable Member Kosa. Doctor, thank you so much for, uh, maybe for the invite. I must say that uh, sitting here and listening to all the presentations has been an eye-opener, to be honest. It's better we honest with these things from the very beginning, but uh, I'm happy with the proposals that we made, that there must be a follow-up workshop. Not only one, you know. It must be continuous because learning is continuous so that this thing sinks in and members are able to engage and engage meaningfully on these matters. All right, I, I am of the view that uh, maybe the next step, you know, having had this, would be to have a vigorous public education, besides members of parliament, vigorous public education uh, to intrigue interest in people out there, but also uh, the support that you would need from the uh, broader citizenry. Um, I would also like to commend the President for the Presidential Council on the FIR. I take it that, uh, I'm sorry I haven't done my homework before coming, I take it that the Minister of Finance would be part of that. Because without him in there, how do you, you know, introduce the thinking on financing for this? So uh, I take it, but if not, I'm sure when you see it, you would propose that he He's, you know, he's, he's brought into this uh, uh, council. To me, this shows a political will. So from here, you, I'm sure you are reassured. I mean, this council is a structure. You start with a structure. And by the president, there is a political will uh, to support. I see this as a steering committee that will steer uh, whatever that will be put on the table forward. But my question is, uh, what is the modus operandi of this council? And why I'm asking this question is because uh, we want to know what to expect. And I'm, I can, you can rest assured, members of parliament would want that so that they use that as a yardstick to measure performance. Because at some point they must account. The last one is, okay, I just want to check that because uh, as I'm, as I put it, I'm sitting here for the first time. Are the two dialogues premised by a feasibility study? And if yes, is there now a maybe a business plan uh, with a projected budget in the medium term? I'm saying this in, in response to the issue raised by the chairperson of the committee who said a separate budget for FIR uh, must be appropriated. I come from the, I'm the chairperson of the Standing Committee on Appropriations. Mm. So if it is to be appropriate, there must be a plan. Mm -hmm. So that we start thinking, you know, and aligning uh, the thinking with the budget. Uh, and why I said there must be a vigorous education, public education. You know the response that you get outside. Honestly speaking, I've sat in, in, in workshops where I had people saying, I'm talking big business saying, where is government's plan? I don't know if I'm the only one. Now, which then means there is a pressing need to come up with something, you know, even if it's a preliminary plan, and start talking about it. Because people say, where is the plan? Where is the plan? Just talking. So they don't want a talk show. <laughs> talk show, they now want to see a plan, which then the members of parliament would want to see the implementation thereof. That would be my take, thanks.
Thank you very much, Honourable Member Koza. Um, I, I, a couple of those questions I'm going to ask the Minister to respond to, actually, uh, in a second. Let me take, sorry, the very last two questions. So one at the back and then Yancy, and then I do have to close it, uh, otherwise we're not going to make lunch, and that's very important. Thank you very much. It's not a question, it's, it's a comment. My name is Trinisi Letelwa, and I'm heading up the Centre for Public Service Innovation. Colleagues have spoken about um, open data or democratization of data, and I thought I needed to share, as the Center for Public Service and Administration, we've been piloting an initiative, working with Open Up and Gig Culture and those groups uh, to try and open up government data. I must be very clear, this is already public data where we are curating it and making it more user-friendly, and we're trying to uh, encourage groups who work with data to come up with apps that are service delivery oriented. We've been having a number of hackathons as well where we are using this data and trying to come up with solutions working with young people. So in a way we are really trying to make sure that there is a bit of work government is doing to use data. Uh, it's also quite a good economic opportunity for young people who can do some good stuff and come up with apps uh, for that type of data, so all that stuff we are interested to working with uh, colleagues around the table as well in doing more on that. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you very much. And then last one from, from Yancy. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, I think that there's something very important that we mustn't neglect, and uh, that's that word of industrial in the name. I know that it has compre the 4 IR has comprehensive implications, but it is a, a question of industry. And South Africa is committed to industrialization. Without industrialization, we can't go forward economically and we cannot create jobs. And the 4 IR technologies can actually help us to do that. So advanced manufacturing um, is a huge part where we can actually work at implementing it. We don't have to reinvent the technology. It's there. In fact, the CSRR has done a lot to, um, to actually investigate that research and develop in that space. Um, advanced manufacturing, using advanced materials, using minerals that we haven't exploited in South Africa before, um, methodologies that are now possible, 3D printing, um, and, and integrating various things like automation in production is something that, that needs more attention. You know, I know the, the car manufacturers have some automation, but factories can be completely um, automated. Various industries can be automated, and it doesn't need to lead um, to, to job losses if we're serious about reskilling. Um, but ultimately, we need to get income for South Africa. And if we don't get income for South Africa, we're lost, basically. And even as we you know, try and navigate the 4IR, if we don't prevent those job losses and create new jobs, we are done for. Thank you, Yancy. Um, before I come to my panel, if I can, Minister, can I put you on the spot very briefly, um, particularly around the, um, the modus operandi for the Fourth Industrial Revolution Council, the Presidential Council, uh, and then maybe a quick word on um, awareness of the plan that is then created. Thank, thank you, Prof. Uh, we had, uh, I think it was around the 5th of December, issued the terms of, of, of reference for the Commission whereby we were saying it's going to be advising uh, cabinet on, 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 on the direction to the 4IR, but most importantly to make sure that, like I said, we speak with one voice as South Africa, an inclusive structure to say how do we come up with a country plan and therefore, via that country plan, that's what we'll be going to implement as the different sectors. This is my, my contribution to it. So that's crucial to, to the work that will be done by, by the commission. Uh, secondly, the other question was... Just in terms of the 
awareness of that plan once we have it? How do we intend to go? We, yes. Oh my goodness, you're going to be stuck with my face everywhere you go to. <laughs> because we're preparing for the Digital Economy Summit, as I said earlier, which is the first platform of saying, let's talk together as for IRSA. This, this is what we want to produce as the plan after the first dialogue. And we'll be publicizing that. But as I said, we want to have it a broader representation because if we're able to do that, then we have all the different sectors represented, and what we, we then do is to utilize the, the communication platforms that we have. I didn't say media. Communication platforms, all of them, those that we have to make sure that information goes to all. And it, like I said, it will not be a plan for government only. The legislature from its own side will have to come up with its own plan Private sector, different sectors will be coming with their own plan, including the judiciary, because somebody raises an important thing on the issue of cyber threats. How do we make sure that these same workshops that you are holding or hosting for, for the legislator, for the policymaker, the judiciary is also involved? I, I follow certain things, and I was looking at one particular case that I was laughing at, where somebody alleged that this is what transpired, and therefore people were looking for proof, and in the system the proof was not there, and I laughed. Do people know how mischievous we are with these technologies? Because we just delete everything from online. And indeed, you'll be trying to trace, was I indeed in Cape Town? And the system will not reflect on that. That's, the, that's why we're talking of the ethics of everything that we're doing. So all these things, they require all of us judiciary to be aware or to be alert that this is the space we're operating in, and therefore these are the pros and cons of it. So the same applies to, to, to other sectors. But there is one thing, uh, Prof, before I sit down, that was also raised. In, in, in terms of from from Butle of the HSRC on the psycho-emotional aspect, how are, we, how are we dealing with that? Because if you read, read now, you will see that lots of our children, they're suffering from depression or anxiety. They don't know how to cope. One of the reasons is because if you go to social media, everybody accepts them. They're able to project themselves as these successful, beautiful girls and boys and all that. And then when they come back to face reality, it's not the same. There they are successful and they get to be exposed. You know social media can be brutal at times. And they then get to be crushed. And they can't accept that they want to die because they see these friends, artificial friends that they have, as the people are rejecting them. Therefore, one of the things that we have said, that's why when we talk of the jobs of the future, we're like, there's certain jobs that can never be taken away by robots. People will have to have psychological counseling at all times. But how do we make sure that we introduce at that elementary level, if we are talking at a primary level, as they grow, as we introduce them to technologies, they also get to be empowered. If you look at, at I think Silicon Cape does have it. Uh, if you look at, at 42, uh, on, 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 no, no, not Sloan. The bigger version of Silicon Cape in California. The Silicon Valley, 42 on Silicon. If, 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 you, if you go there, even when they introduce the training, you find that there's lots of people who deal with the psychological side. Although it's peer-driven, there's no teacher in front of you, you get to do project-based, but there are people that must deal with it when you're like, I'm not coping, how do I survive? You get so angry that they take these computers, they slap it because they feel like it is this thing that is making me feel useless. But at the same time, now to those that are already at work, the threat, like I, I, I was telling the other group that at home, I come from a village in Tata. I've been putting lots of helpers to keep the house. And I come back, my house is not clean, I'm not happy and all that. And we've got to get into an argument, I'm like, I'm done. I want people to come up with a robot to clean my house. I approach this group from Midrand, they're like, we've never done a robot. A secretary, yes, but a robot we've never done. And I'm like, I'm giving you a challenge program that. I don't want somebody who's going to be responding to me. I want somebody who's going to do what one would be programmed to do. And that's the reality that, that we are moving to. But how do you then, when the robot does not understand now, because it has not been programmed to, to do whatever the other thing that you want to add with. So I was like, this is going to be a test for me to say, are these things working indeed? But the psychological now aspect of it, if this robot gets to be cheeky and it decides to overreact, how will I, I, I react to that? So it's, it's these things that we're saying, th there's jobs that will never be replaced, but also there's more space or demand that's going to be created also by the introduction of, 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 this, of these technologies that we're talking about. Thank you.
Excellent. Thank you, Minister. I'm going to move directly on to the panel um, for their comments. Um, Chair, they will. Yes, I'm sorry. sorry just Chair. before you move to the to the panel, I just want to correct one small thing. Um, um, Honourable Posa said, spoke of the. I, I spoke of we are pushing for a separate vote on RNT, not budget. Vote. Vote. Thank you, Chair. We need all the ministers there. <laughs> um, the, the panel will be giving um, a bit of a representation from their area of expertise and some of the activities that have been happening within their space and then responding to a number of the questions. Um, if there are some questions that we do not get to, um, it has been a fairly vibrant session. Thank you very much for that. Um, we will have a look at those questions and get formal responses and include them in the report that we write up after this, which will be shared. Um, so I want to start on my far left over here with Shyam. Thanks. You can go. Oh, you don't have a. I don't know if it'll. No, it won't work. Okay. I think, Shyam, maybe you can come up. Or, no, you can come up here. It's fine. I can step aside for a second. Thanks, Dr. Fisser. Uh, just as a quick introduction, I'm Sean Ranshaw. I, I represent uh, Deloitte. I'm a digital transformation leader in Deloitte. I'm also here representing uh, for IRSA. So, Minister uh, Abrams, I'm one of your cadets in your army of building the capable for our um, nation. So um, there were a number of questions. I apologize, I, ha I haven't been able to capture all of them. But I think some of the themes that I have been able to capture is one around organizational change and the pace of change that is really, uh, um, that 4IR is, is uh, creating, not only amongst organizations, but in society and for, for legislature and the pressures that's placing in the entire, in, in the entire system. Uh, in my daily job, I engage lots of C-suite around the topic of 4IR, and once the conversation goes beyond the technology, it quickly leads to leadership and the mindset change that's required in order for the change that it, uh, it incubates to be sustainable for that business. And for that to happen, the, um, the change has to be driven from the edges. So Minister Abrams has mentioned about the fact that uh, a lot of the uh, work that needs to happen and the incubation that needs to happen in order to drive this change has to come from the edges of society. And, um, and it's true for society as it is true for organizations. Um, Many organizations, large organizations, struggle because they believe that change is driven from the center and from the core. And what we've been doing for a few years at Deloitte is encouraging them to listen to the edges. Because by empathizing with the people that are closest to the work that need to happen, uh, they are able to better understand how for IR technology like IoT, like AI, uh, can improve the work that they are doing. They can better understand the, skill, uh, the skills transformation that is needed at the edges in order to transform um, the work those people do, irrespective of whether the, those jobs are vulnerable to automation. So a couple of things that I, I thought um, I'd highlight um, the first one was around um, some of the principles. So give me a second. Yep. So five principles for uh, the future of regu regulation. This was a report that was driven out by and produced by Deloitte uh, three months ago. And uh, five principles that were mentioned, which I believe are relevant to some of the topics and questions that were asked here. The first one was adaptive regulation. Agile government has to come with adaptive regulation. So move from a regulate and forget world to an iterative regulation cycle. And uh, design thinking, which is a corporate term which is used to empathize, uh, empathize with the problem 
then design and uh, uh, design possible solutions and ideate with the people that are most affected by those problems and then prototype those solutions in a meaningful way so that those people can test the solutions before they implement it at scale. Those type of methodologies together with system thinking are quite useful in adaptive regulation. The second one is regulatory sandboxes and greenhouses. Um, often investors find it difficult to invest in startups because they haven't really fully understood the regulatory impact of their inventions. And creating an environment where regulators can work with startups and partner with private companies and universities just to ensure that there's an environment in which the regulatory boundaries are tested on their inventions um, will be useful. And I think there's a role for um, legislature and policies to encourage regulators to create these sandbox greenhouse environments. The third one is outcome-based regulation. So regulations that are not determining the technical inputs of the technologies that are being applied here, but um, really that are uh, driven by the outcomes. A good example would be drone technology. I mean, drone technology, you could, you could regulate you know, the, the power consumption of drone technology, or you could regulate the distances drone technology, uh, uh, drones are allowed to fly within a, a, a zoned out area. But I guess the best type of regulation is to just regulate the fact that drones cannot fly vehicles that endanger people. If you provide an outcome-based regulation, startups are then given the freedom to innovate around that outcome rather than uh, the inputs that are needed to keep regulation alive. Um, and then I think the one size fits, fits all scenario is, is an important thing. Regulation to date has been largely based on a one size fits all model. And with the advent of digital technology, uh, one size does not fit all. Uh, there are various nuances and and segmentation of society into smaller groups will become absolutely necessary so that we, ca we can cater for the innovators and the entrepreneurs that are experimenting with these technologies. If South Africa is looking to reduce the cost of pioneering this technology and reduce its reliance on global corporates that have already paid the high price of research and development, then it needs to reduce and apply a, a regulatory framework that is risk-weighted and that allows uh, small startups to be able to scale their solutions in a, in a safe environment. And the last one has been spoken about at length is around collaboration. Both national and international collaboration is absolutely necessary. There was a question around how we can integrate Africa and I think there's, uh, there's absolutely a way to integrate the, the, the agenda across Africa by uh, cross-border collaboration uh, between our African counterparts who are already uh, taking a leading role in some of the technologies as was mentioned today, like Rwanda and Kenya and other countries. Um, Dr. Fusser, that's that's it for me. Thank you very much. Um, as we recognize, uh, Honorable Causa has to catch a flight. Um, I think let's take Ilza first and then I'll keep it. Um, good morning. Thank you very much for, for all the questions and the opportunity to address some of the questions. Um, I'm working in the Department of Trade and Industry, uh, creating capacity um, and um, doing research to develop a policy and a strategy for um, the digital industrial economy. Um, so I will touch on um, some of the questions and what we, what we are busy with at the moment. I think the, the human aspect is um, very important um, and we recognize that and that will definitely form part of 
a social compact that we are busy with. Um, and I'm not sure if you have seen the Human Development Report um, also touching on um, the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, and if you read that report, you will see that the human aspect is um, for IR or the fourth industrial revolution, um, policies and strategies must be um, formulated um, around the, the human element or um, um, human aspect. Um, uh, and then on curriculum development, um, as a department, we actually saw the gap um, 10 years ago in industry uh, with our tooling industry that was um, um, getting smaller and smaller. So in terms of tooling, uh, maybe just quickly, um, you need uh, tools to, to equip um, a factory or a, plan, a plant um, if you want to manufacture something. Um, so we identified as the department um, it is critical to support the tooling industry and we uh, started uh, developing curriculum as national qualifications, um, which is aligned to for IR. And we are ready with our program to expand the program into industrial maintenance, um, megatronics and robotics that's aligned to um, the, the world trends. We've benchmarked that against Germany um, models and the US engineering standards. Um, so students uh, participating in the program will um, have international qualifications. And there's, there's information on um, DTI's website um, about the program. Um, then on um, institutions, um, we are um, releasing a research paper on meso institutions. Um, the question on how do we um, design um, or change um, organizations. Um, that's typically um, science councils and other technical um, infrastructure organizations that will have to adapt and will have to change their business models to align to 4IR. And of course, with that, we, uh, we have to get political commitment and we have to uh, review their mandates. Um, in terms of um, the community um, and communications to the community, um, as a department, um, we are prioritizing the township economy and we are going to focus on industrial parks and developing industrial parks and uh, skills alongside that. Um, in terms of connectivity, connectivity is also about Internet of Things and the cybersecurity um, systems. So in the um, implementation of systems, there's um, a lot of things that are interrelated. And from, from our view, um, we need to look at policy coherence and alignment if we are going to look at um, systems development for connectivity. Um, the issue of data, maybe just quickly on um, the data for industry. Um, we think it's very important to create platforms where we make um, uh, technology available to industry, um, to present it to industry. And that also um, touches on, on the awareness and understanding of um, the digital economy. Um, uh, awareness and understanding of 4IR is going to be one of our main themes of our um, digital industrial policy. And we will um, um, implement programs, design programs and implement programs to, to um, discuss um, and have um, policy dialogues on, on 4IR. Mm, I think... There's just two other things, then I will finish. Um, in terms of Africa, um, what we are seeing um, working uh, with um, a lot of organizations like the World Economic Forum um, and um, BRICS, um, we've established a partners, 
partnership with um, the, f uh, the four other BRICS countries um, for 4IR. And we are also, also working with the World Economic Forum and um, working um, platforms like G20 where we have discussions. And looking at the demo demographics and the aging of uh, the world workforce, we are seeing that the world workforce are getting older and older. And most of the developing countries are talking about Africa's uh, demographic dividend. So the demographic dividend that they are referring to is um, the young people in Africa. There's going to be so, or there is actually already so many young people in Africa and there's a huge opp opportunity for the world to invest in the young people of Africa and do skills development. And there's at the moment a lot of research and papers that are released um, to look at um, the, Af the demographic dividend of Africa and um, what are the opportunities. Um, we see uh, companies like Microsoft um, in investing a lot and doing running a lot of programs. Um, the African Development Bank and um, the New Development Bank um, who supports BRICS and the BRICS countries are, are also looking at developing um, programs. Then lastly on industrialization, um, I agree with um, the um, industrialization and automation and that we will have to look at jobs. Um, like I mentioned, as a department, we already looked at um, a system solution for, um, for companies or industries to move into the fourth industrial revolution. And we are ready to scale that program. But one um, element that as a, as a department that we are looking at at the moment is to look at commercialization of innovation. Um, I'm a council member for the National Advisory Council on Innovation. And one of the objectives of bringing um, an industri industry perspective into, into innovation is also to look at not only um, research-based innovation that's being commercialized, but also looking at what solutions um, are out there that was actually introduced by industry and commercializing that together with uh, protecting the um, intellectual property right. Because there's lots of examples of companies that, that are um, innovating um, as industry solutions and we actually don't know about them. One of our biggest tooling companies are designing tools for Germany and they are exporting and, um, they, and people actually don't know that we as South Africa or designing for um, um, the lead um, country in terms of manufacturing. So I think, yeah, I will stop there. <laughs> Thanks, Prof. Just shortly before I call you up, um, I just want to recognize uh, Honorable Chair Maseko. Thank you so much for your time here. Uh, I know you do have to go to a meeting now and then catch a flight. I just have to catch a flight just now, so I can stay for a little bit longer. But thank you very much for your contribution today and for chairing the session for us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair, and thank you to everybody who attended. Um, I, I really feel better that I have to leave before the meeting ends because um, there's so much valuable information that is coming from the panel, but it was beyond my control. Thank you very much once again. Prof. Sidian. Uh, thank you very much, Donald. So I, I, I'm going to be uh, quite brief here. I have many pages, um, but I'm going to uh, simply take advantage of all the good things that other people have said already, and I'm going to just focus on what it is that we at the HSRC do. Human Sciences Research Council. We at the Human Sciences Research Council are all about understanding you. I mean, that's who we are. It's our job to explain what this country is all about. You know, what's going on inside of people's heads. 
So, so we really are, if you like, in a sense, these people standing out there trying to interpret and make sense of how the thinking about everyday life is unfolding, developing, and proceeding, uh, and so on. So if you don't mind, I'd like to talk about you, uh, just, just for a few minutes. And the big thing to say to, to you about us is this extraordinarily complicated point to make about how different we actually are. How different each of us actually is. So these categories that we use to describe each other, race, class, da 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 da, da they help for a little while, but they don't help properly. And each of us in these terms is incredibly distinct. And so we are these people that this 4IR is having to, in a sense, interact with. We are the citizens, we in all of this difference, this distinct difference that each of us is, is what this 4IR world is all about. So the 4IR are not these regulated Japanese standing in a line waiting to enter into a train, uh, very obedient. Uh, uh, we are these incredibly unpredictable, disruptive, uh, divergent, disobedient, I say again, uh, people who uh, are standing here alongside of this technology. And I'd like to say to you, we come in all types and sizes in relation to all of us. Some of us are obsessed with it. We're obsessed with the technology, right? We have a deep, deep sense of what this technology is all about. We can tell you about how these new nanoprocesses are being interfaced with uh, these synapses in our brains and how all of that technology might be uh, unfolding. But I need to also say to all of us that a whole lot of us are, a whole lot of us are extremely skeptical. We're skeptical for all sorts of re reasons. We're skeptical because we feel left out, right? We feel that there is an exclusion in the very way in which this thing is coming into being. And, and it's a, a, a deep kind of ontological thing about us as, as human beings. But we're also skeptical religiously. You know? We are deeply anxious about how this stuff is coming to us in ways which uh, uh, have this kind of hubristic god-like features about it. And so we don't want it. There are amongst us a whole lot of us who uh, are resentful because we are being told that there's going to be a process of displacement, your job is gonna be taken. So I wanted to say to you that as this thing is coming to, to all of us here, you know, we need to be deeply aware that of course this question of economic inequality and the compounding things which are going to arise out of it are really important, but we also need to think about how this becomes, and it's partly your question, Bushley, how this thing become, becomes part of who we are as human beings, right? How is, how is this going to be managed by us as human beings? How are we going to help people in their heads come to a realization, listen, that there is no stepping back away from this. We can't prohibit this. Uh, we are not going to be able to outlaw it by legislation. And the important examples, Siraj, uh, governance is broken down in very many parts of, of West Africa already. It's, it's completely broken down. The regulatory frameworks are such that uh, you have governments, but you've got communities of people working out how to manage the spaces in which they find themselves using technologies that are incredible. It's happening already. So what I'm saying to you, co colleagues, is that we cannot avoid this. We cannot avoid the space in which we find ourselves, but we have to be thinking about how we begin to imagine ourselves as human beings with all of our diversities, all our needs, all of our interests, all our requirements, all our aspirations, and how we can be good people. 
in all of this? How do you make us better citizens? You know, how do we become good future human beings? So I'd like to say that this is our job to make sense of at the HSRC, and it's a hell of a job. You know, so we're very excited about uh, these apps that will tell me when the b bus is going to come, uh, but we'd also like to know how our citizenship is going to unfold in, 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 in all of this. How we begin to get South Africans to not see this technology as new whiteness, to give you an example, new whiteness, right? I mean, how do we make it such that it is a, a moment in which human beings truly begin to explore possibility in a way which has never happened uh, before. And it's an extraordinary, extraordinary, extraordinary moment. All of these old categories that we've got, white, black, uh, and so on, you know, we need to be now rethinking because power is being articulated in all of this, I want to say, in really complicated kinds of ways, and you need to be aware of that. So we're very excited to be uh, um, in this space uh, thinking about all of this. Uh, and um, we uh, look forward to the challenge of ethics, the challenge uh, of uh, what you now see are these new forms of human beings with implants that uh, uh, are completely unthinkable and, you know, how we might begin to deal with that. And then this final question of, of, of the self, of whether we're going to tell somebody in the end, Bushley, sorry, five hours only is all you're going to have with that internet. You know, and begin to think about the, the regulatory, the self-regulatory dimensions of all of us, the self I will begin to make ethical choices for myself, not just, you know. And um, the, uh, uh, I've said this before, you know, the, uh, the excitement of being in a space like this for me is, is absolutely tremendous. So I'm very thankful for us to have this opportunity to be able to, you know, talk and think into this space and say to us, we really look forward to exploring uh, some of these deep, deep questions with all of you. Thank you. Hi there, I'm Johnny Fries, Jonathan Fries, Western Cape Education Department. Hey, the future isn't what it used to be anymore. Eh? 50 years ago, we could clearly predict I'm gonna be a white collar worker or a blue collar worker. Now we have no idea what's gonna happen in 50 years time. That's just the reality of it. And how must education respond to that? Education previously was, uh, you just dump stuff down people's throats and they must just chew on it and spit it out when they write the exams. But we're living in different times now. The reality is, is, is exactly that. Schools must change, methodologies must change. We have teacher-centered method methodology. Note, teacher-centered, old, necessary still, but must it be dominant? We also use learner-centered methodology. We say fantastic, but is that good enough? What about learner-led methodology? Learner-led methodology, we're talking about those four Cs. If we have learner-led methodology, we're looking towards those four C's. Learners with critical thinking, learners collaborating with each other, learners displaying the creativity and the communication skills. We have Wendy Horn over there, who's a principal of one of the most innovative schools in the country. Wendy, if your school, I'm asking you this question, Wendy. If you have the four C's at your school, your school must be on the point of virtual disruption on a daily basis. Because if you have learner-led methodology and it's successful, it's a step away from learners being activists 
And that's how rental for being citizens on this planet, is act learners that are activists. If you are producing learner activists at your school, then you are doing the four C's. And why are these four C's so important? All the other information is going to be done by the robots in the future. So there's a question about the CAPS curriculum. CAPS curriculum had its space. It had its space. We have to look at every teacher, besides their expertise, they must be a life skills teacher. Because we are, we are talking about how do we separate human beings from the robots. And the CAPS curriculum is there for robots to chew up at the moment. Because we're not emphasizing the four C's adequately. What are we actually doing in terms of here in the Western Cape Edu Education Department? Is there support for the fourth, fourth Industrial Revolution? Yes, there is, absolutely there is support from that. The SG speaks Fourth Industrial Revolution in every speech. E-learning talks in every speech. It demands of officials on a weekly basis to report on what they are doing in the e-learning space. But the, the discussion in the e-learning space still needs to be enhanced. I don't think there's enough discussion there. Around policy, what's happening around policy? Coding curriculum nationally is, is happening. Pilot starts this year, 2019, from foundation phase, which is grade R to three, as well as senior phase, grade seven to nine. There's a pilot happening in seven of the nine provinces. That is happening. What am I doing in terms of my responsibility? I am the head of technology in the province. Technology as a subject, grade seven to nine, senior phase. It's a compulsory phase of education. This uh, subject includes uh, all the, basically the engineering fields. And we're looking at uh, structural engineering, mechanisms, electronics, and processing. That's basically the areas of, and we do problem solving in that. So you're looking at design thinking that was mentioned earlier on. That's part of our curriculum is design thinking. Problem solving, investigate, design, make and evaluate the natural process. What am I doing in that space? The CAPS curriculum, if I take, let's get down to, to, to the reality of it. To change the curriculum, it was mentioned earlier on, it's gonna take eight, two years. We don't have that time. So I have to look within the current curriculum. What do I actually do within the current curriculum? Give you a very specific example. Grade nine, term two, we teach mechanisms. Grade nine, term three, we teach electronics. My word, bring the two together. What do you have? Mechatronics. And why not? Why not? So you rather modify what exists instead of trying to come up with a new curriculum. Because that is, after two years, my word, we, we also left behind after two years. So we have to innovate now. What am I actually doing in that space? It's two things, three things. Two things. The one pilot this year is taking the electronics, developed an electronics board. You can build over 500 circuits on there. Um, learners will now can, can build a circuit in under a minute, which a teacher would normally take 20 minutes. That's done. That's ready. That prototype is done. It's, um, that's ready for the pilot. That's, now, that is not the important one. Where's the fourth industrial revolution? It's the next board. It will be done by the end of this year. The next board will take all the mechanisms of term two, you mix that with the board of term three. Now, and you bring coding into that space, now you have true mechatronics and you're gonna have robotics taking place. And not only mechatronic robot, you can code anything. It's just about creating a context where a problem is, and a challenge needs to be sorted and, 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 and these learners can, can take up that challenge. That board, also, by press of the button, the, 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 the problem that they've solved gets, gets taken up into the cloud and gets assessed by the cloud, and that data is immediately available to the teacher per child, per group, per class, per grade. That will, be, that will be done by the end of this year, ready for a pilot in next year. So 
we want every single learner to experience this, to be able to say, I've tried this mechatronics nonsense and I don't want to do this as a career, and others to say, hey, my word, a, a whole new field has opened up to me. I speak to make it people involved in mechatronics, they only learned about it after matric. Whereas you got other kids from, that learn about these things from primary school already, by the time they're 19, they earn their first million dollars. Why don't we, why don't we have millionaires that are teenagers in this country? We have to do, they have to get there. And the other issue that we need to deal with is data must be, for education sites, has to be free. I want that out there, please. We want free. Working on, on solutions in that regard, but that's only in a, in a different space at the moment. The other problem that we have in education is, uh, it was mentioned earlier on, the aging workforce of teachers. Average age of a teacher is 53, they're not waiting for 60, they're waiting for 55. Because they're done with the space. What do we do, how do we respond? I'm working with a lot of, I'm doing a lot of collaboration, with lots of companies, we don't do collaboration, nothing ever is ever going to happen. I can go into detail if you want me to. But simulations, if they can train a fireman to be fully qualified in six months, while using simulations, as opposed to normally it would happen in, in three years. Simulation, they train pilots for decades, they're training pilots using the simulation. So bring simulation into the classroom. You can create myriads of challenging problem solving for kids using simulation. In terms of education, simulation and activity and actual practice right, lights up the same areas in the brain. So the, learn, the same learning happens and sometimes been proven also by the um, uh, California Institute that quite often greater learning happens via simulation than via a real life simulation. So I'm looking at the space of, of, of simulation in education that all these teachers that are leaving and that are retiring, we retain their services to create contexts for children to solve um, simulation. Um, so that's, that, that's the area that we, that we are functioning at. But generally, the conversation around fourth industrial revolution and how policy unfolds is not happening as I would like it to see. We need to have a serious overhaul of the CAPS curriculum as a matter of absolute urgency. We need to have a serious overhaul of thinking about how we um, develop teachers, professional development of teachers, and how learners learn. It takes a learner we need only have on, the, on the site, on the cell phone, we've got two seconds to capture a learner. Two seconds. And uh, that is what research is showing. How is education responding to that? We are not responding to that. I would like you to hear, just for a, a, a moment, to hear what uh, Wendy Horn is doing at the school. A run out of time. Okay. 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 Thank you. I'm very aware of the time. I'm Leona Crawford. I'm the director of the long name, um, CoLab, which stands for Collaborative Laboratory for E-Inclusion and Social Innovation. I'm based at the University of the Western Cape. Um, we, uh, no, we are partially funded by the um, Department of Telecom and Postal Services through NAMISA to drive the digital skills agenda and organizational capability with a strong research and innovation and focus. There were a few questions and that I would like to respond on, but I think the point I went, want to start is to say, um, I've been in this space for seven years and it initially started off with focusing on skills development, but when you, from inclusion to your competitive, which also covers data analytics, 
But when you start in the skills space, you actually over time ask the questions, but exactly as the minister said, but other people are also doing that, and why are we doing it, and what are we walk, working towards? Then you realize, okay, we need partnerships, so maybe we need to start talking together and with one another, and then you realize, but you know what? We actually need a shared vision of where we go. Now, and that gets me to the point of what we are all busy with is actually social innovation change process for the country. That we need to define part of this conversation should be around what is the kind of country we want to create for ourselves and not the focus on the technology per se, but in this changing technological landscape, what is the vision for us as a country? Um, and in that, and that will drive the action. And in that, I want to respond to the two people from the Human Sciences um, Council. I'm a psychologist, and I'm always proud to say that in the techie debate, because uh, I think still the 4 conversation has been dominated by technology discussion. It's time that social and human scientists become part of the conversation, because it's about the society we create. Um, on the one hand, and that's the role we play, we are the evangelists because we need to create awareness, we need to get the skills, we need to get the process going. But while you do that, you also have to be on the other side, consider around what are the ethical implications, what are the people implications, what is the implications for the well-being of people. That is what we are trying to do um, in, through social innovation in our process, to collaborate with partners across sectors, government, education, business, um, civil society, to create the shared agenda and, uh, and uh, for action. Let me quickly give you an example. Um, and where we are in the province now, we've kicked off um, a process um, on determining what we call the as is. And I want to um, interrupt myself and say, I think part of this discussion is important that it becomes evidence-based. We speak a lot about, you know, data and all, and you know, 4 R will impact this, it will impact that, but we need to get to specifics. So we've kicked off the process um, that we said we are going to work towards a shared agenda um, in this particular sector. We've done an as is where we looked at what is currently happening, what is the supply of particular from the university, from the TV colleges. What are the requirements for, from industry? What is the futuristic perspective? Bring that together and in consultation with industry, academia, um, civil society, we are going to formulate a plan of action where each one can see their role. And a concrete action is if you, if you have a coalition, if you people participate, if there's a shared vision, they actually don't feel threatened. They actually can see what is the change they can make. And for example, in this discussion around tourism, where we did this as is and to be, the TV colleges that participated in the session immediately went home and actually addressed their curriculum. Because they could see what the industry was telling them and they could see um, where the futuristic perspective would lead them to. So with that I confirm, or oh, oh, just want to iterate, that it's a collaborative process, it's a shared vision, and we need to focus um, on, on the well-being of, of us as a country. Um, I know there's another one, I want to talk about the, the concept of, of social media. I think it's extremely important that we focus on digital literacy, which now includes media literacy, um, as well as data literacy. Um, the whole point about public awareness, I think that is over and above the things we do in the you know, higher enchilance, the higher education, the research, the research innovation, um, there's a huge need for raising the general awareness around media and data li literacy to protect individuals. And I think with that I'm going to stop. Uh, afternoon. I won't delay your lunch. Um, I think I'll just quickly respond to a few questions here. Um, and I'll start from the, the comment that was made by Yancy regarding the um, advanced manufacturing component. 
and how that will shape the, the jobs into the future. And I'll couple that with the, the comment that was made by uh, Israel on, uh, on the areas of focus, to so say what should we really focus on to make sure that we're not left behind. From the CSR point of view, we, we have looked into this in a very detailed form. Where we ended up coming up with a strategy that looks into, on one element, future of production, where we look into the future of production from various sectors, it'd be mining, it'd be defense sector, it'd be manufacturing, it'd be chemicals. We then also look into how the fourth industrial revolution can actually uh, change how our institutions are supposed to be. Should parliament still operate the same way going into the future? Should uh, um, our state-owned enterprises work the same way? How do we then design them to fit into that? And that then talks to a number of uh, fields that talk to the smart places, the smart logistics, how the next generation health is supposed to be. So essentially, the, the key part is that, indeed, there are a lot of areas that these technologies will talk to, but are we ready to then advance the country in those areas? And in many areas, there's a lot of work that needs to be done from a research point of view, from, you know, even AI is very far from, from being uh, um, um, industrial ready. Uh, if you think of what we have now as IoT, uh, the, the world is now talking about a number of other things, internet of many things, internet of everything. They're all sort of coming together. And when everything is connected, we start having other problems that I'm gonna just touch to, uh, or uh, touch on very quickly. So the issue on, on is this one, on the, on the areas of focus and, the, uh, and the, the alteration of the education. I think it goes beyond just offering adequate education. It also talks to creating an enabling environment where the youngsters of today can thrive. Just to give you a small example of this, if you look into guys that we know as the innovators, um, Larry, um, uh, Ellison was the founder of uh, Oracle, he was 32 when he did that. Uh, Pierre Omija, eBay, he was 28. Yeri Young founded Yahoo 25. Larry Page and uh, Sergey Breen founded Google at 25. Um, Kemp founded Uber at 24. Steve Jobs was 21 when he founded uh, Apple. Bill Gates was 20. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg, 19 when he founded Facebook. One common factor that you'll find around them is that they are all dropouts. I've realized that simply because the environment that was created was not suitable for them to innovate. So I think we need to factor those into the picture to say, how do we then create an environment that uh, is inclusive, that can enable innovations to still happen within the environment that is supposed to, uh, uh, to take place? They don't necessarily need to, to be, to be dropped out to, to succeed in those environments. Um, one issue that I wanted to just touch on, which is very uh, touchy, I gave a Sophistic Bernard Price Memorial Lecture uh, two years ago, and this talks to the issue of data bias, which was raised by uh, the colleague from, I think your colleague on the other side. And the issue on the data bias, without getting into the details, is a very big issue. When I was doing my PhD uh, just over, I think about 15 years ago, um, there was no data that one could find on various topics, issues of if you want to do face recognition, you can go and get databases from China, you can get them from Canada and so on. But there was never an African database. This day and age, if you go and look for an African database, we still don't have any. Now, the bigger issue is that we then train these systems using the data that's available. But most of the data that we have is not coming from the African spaces. Then because of that, you quickly realize that we are biased or that you have systems system that will work for, for one group of people and not for the other. But the biggest issue there is that we are not participating in the data creation or making the data, availab uh, data available. And that's a big issue that, it's not an issue of policy, it's an issue of, I mean, there are many issues that talk to, to that, which I think we need to, to make sure that we, we are also active participants in the creation of data. Linked to this, there's an issue on social media data, which was raised by Nkululeko. And I'll talk to, to, to this through an example that we did, where the work that we're doing for City of Tswane, very quickly. Um, we were doing predictive policing. So the whole point was to say, how do you then position police adequately within, within, within the city of Tshwane to cap crime? So we went to the police, went to the, to, to, the, to the metro police and we asked them for data. They couldn't give us data, they said, no, no, it's sensitive, all sorts of stories. They, they gave us all sorts of red tape to say you cannot get data. But we, we quickly realized that it's fine. In fact, even their data might not be even complete. We can actually find data on social media. 
people report crimes on social media than, than, than to the police station. You, you get your phone uh, uh, hacked, uh, or rather, uh, 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 you know, somebody robs your, your cell phone uh, and you're on the, uh, on the way to work, in all likelihood, you're not going to go to the police station. You just go and put it on, on Facebook and say, my phone just got uh, stolen. So in the process, we then developed a crime hotspot. Um, uh, uh, it's more like a, a database for the crime hotspots in, in the city of Swan. What we then realized was that we could pick more crime, crime hotspots than what the police had. Immediately after that, when we went to the city of, of, of Tswane, to the Metro Police Department, they were then now very free to give us their data. They said, no, no, we can actually give you the data because we realize that you have, you have all this data. The point is that data is very much available uh, uh, on the net because people are putting all sorts of data in various forms, uh, in social media, and so on. But there are questions that were raised, issues of, uh, for instance, who owns the data, and that's a very big issue uh, because my data, if I put it publicly, uh, who's who takes care of, uh, of it? Who, who, who's accountable if it's hacked and all those kind of issues? And we don't have policies that then talk to those. So I think that's a very big issue that we need to deal with. Somebody raised an issue about uh, encrypting data and making them available. Of course, we've done work on that. I've had a PhD student who worked on uh, differential privacy where we're looking into, can you then get sensitive data and you still put it publicly and you still be able to infer information from it such that uh, one can uh, use it adequately to then get uh, all the insights that are required. So there are methods that can be used for, for that. The biggest issue is that people are scared of actually giving data, even when they know that there are mechanisms of protecting the data. That's a very sensitive issue. And linked to this, there was an issue that was raised by Mr. Madima at the back about cybersecurity. And let me just touch on that, uh, Jay, is the last part. Cybersecurity is a very critical issue. If you look into the internet, when the internet was created, the biggest focus was not on security, it was on connectivity. That, that was the whole point of the internet. Later on, people started realizing that there are a lot of holes on the internet. And then from there, we then started closing, pitching, and so forth. That, that was an afterthought. We are walking the same path on this fourth industrial revolution. A lot of people are talking about all sorts of these excitements, but we're not even putting a thoughts at all about security of this. The fact that now I can ha hack your TV and then be able to, to see what you're doing in your house, it's, it's a sensitive issue but not many of us are looking into those. Maybe one last comment that I can just talk to here has to do with uh, a sensitive question that was raised, uh, uh, Chef, just allow me, just one. It was on, I think it's a question that was raised about the connectivity to the rural areas. So I have many comments that I, I could give. Recently I was talking to Centec. I think we all know Centec. Centec is the, the, the signal distributor, um, state owned. And we are talk, we are, they are worried about connectivity to say how do we then make sure that connectivity reaches the rural areas. So talking to, to, to them, we realize that there are many other tools or technologies that are available that can assist in actually providing connectivity to the rural areas. One of them is the TV white, uh, white spaces. We know TV, t the, the reach out of TV is, is almost everywhere. You go to the deepest part of the rural areas, they still have a signal, uh, TV signal. Can we then use the TV white spaces, the channels between the channels of your TVs that are not being used to then provide bro uh, broadband? And we're busy with those uh, kind of conversations. So in short, I'm saying there are many ways that need to be looked into. Of course, one has to look into the legislation, look into the laws, how do we change everything to make sure that uh, what we then offer is a comp comprehensive solution that's inclusive, that makes sure that no one is left behind because of where they are placed. Thank you. Um, I think a very big thanks uh, to the panel. There was a lot of rich discussion uh, in all of that. If we could give them all another hand, please. And then I do just want to mention, so I mean, I've been engaging in these various platforms since late 2017. Uh, and I think I need to start talking technology again, because in all of the discussions that we have, um, we discuss social aspects, we discuss education aspects, we discuss inclusivity, and we actually very seldom actually discuss technology anymore, uh, which is, uh, I think, a good sign, actually, because as a system, we're thinking, um, uh, Prof. Crawford, more about people first um, and the inclusion of people, uh, and Prof. Sedin, how people will be uh, absorbing and interacting with these technologies. Uh, we speak about that first before we speak about the actual technology. So uh, I think as a system, we're actually in a, in a pretty good place. 
Um, I want to take this opportunity as I close, first of all, to, to thank the panel for their time uh, and effort for coming down uh, and for giving us their thoughts. Uh, as I said, we, we will take a lot more of the comments and the um, notes that they have taken and include that in the, the greater report. Uh, and then I also want to thank um, first the, the leadership of the Deputy Speaker and the participation of his office and everybody that has supported him over here on my left hand side. Um, to my team at CSR and the comms team and then the comms team at DST, uh, not just for today but for the exhibition over the last week. I think it has been a fantastic effort and a fantastic success. I believe we've managed to raise some significant aware awareness about the fourth industrial revolution and the readiness of South Africa um, to, to take this on. I know we've got a lot of work to do, we've got a lot of policy work to do. Um, but I believe that we're in the right kind of mental space to take this on properly. Um, so thank you very much to all of those bodies um, for this week. It has been brilliant. And then as the chair said earlier, and I'm just the facilitator, not the chair, on behalf of the chair now, we will be having lunch in the new dining hall. New what? New Wing Restaurant. You see, I'm not a parliamentarian. I don't know this place. Um, thank you very much, everybody, for your attendance. Um, as I said, we'll send that report out. Thank you.